uh, critical mass. So um, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Rebecca Hanaweiss. I'm on the board of the San Diego chapter of the ACC. Um, and I'm very pleased that we have two uh, experts in employment law from the San Diego office of Jackson Lewis today here to talk about our um, subject matter. Um, to start, Arcelia Mag Magana um, is an experienced litigator uh, with particular expertise defending PAGA, Private Attorney General Act claims, and responding to inquiries by the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing and Equal Opportunity Commission. She has done a great deal of work representing clients in the hospitality industry and um, does extensive local pro bono and community work and has been recognized uh, as a rising star by the California super lawyers. We also have Jacqueline Reinhardt, who um, is very experienced with collective and individual actions in employment law context with a focus on wage and hour discrimination and misclassification matters. Um, both for class actions and individual action contexts. She's also very involved in the San Diego legal community um, and helps with moot court and mock trial competitions at both the university and the high school level. So thank you both for, for donating your time and I'm really looking forward to hearing your presentation today. Thank you, Rebecca, for that introduction. Um, so I think we will get started. Our presentation today is called Unconscious Bias and Social Movements in the Workplace. How do employers respond? Next slide. So this wouldn't be a lawyerly presentation from lawyers to lawyers without a lawyerly disclaimer. The materials contained in this presentation were prepared by the law firm of Jackson Lewis PC for the participants reference in connection with education webinars presented by Jackson Lewis. Attendees should consult with counsel before taking any actions and should not consider these materials or discussions about these materials to be legal or other advice. And now for the agenda. So we have three main areas of focus for you today. Unconscious bias, what is it? How does bias manifest in the workplace? Learning opportunities, social movements, and calls to cancel. And corporate responses, how should a company respond to a call to cancel an employee because of his or her biases? Social media, off-duty conduct, responding to certain uh, investigation complaints, and the like. And with that, um, my colleague Jacqueline will be doing parts one and two, and I will be doing part three. And I will turn it over to Jacqueline. Great, thanks so much, Arcee. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about kind of what unconscious bias is, and then we can get into how unconscious bias manifests in the workplace. Um, and so I don't think I have control of this presentation, but I will uh, try to follow along so that uh, whoever's controlling it can hit the next button. Uh, so first things first, what is unconscious bias? So in really broad terms, unconscious bias is essentially the automatic filters that your brain applies to its environment in order to process information. Um, and those pieces of information can include what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're smelling, and then information that you're also actively trying to learn like processing words or images. Um, but we need filters in place in order to process all that information. And one of the tools that your brain uses to do that is unconscious bias. The brain takes in about 11 million pieces of information at any given point in time, but can only actually process about 40 pieces at once. Um, so we use those filters in order to process that information. So unconscious biases are essentially uh, mental shortcuts. Um, in psychology, they call them heuristics, which they're shortcuts that your brain uses to quickly process information and to make quick decisions. And they allow an individual to make a decision, pass judgment, or solve a problem quickly and with minimal mental effort. Um, but everyone has different shortcuts that are informed by their past experiences Sometimes some of these mental shortcuts might be based on things like cultural stereotypes. 
Um, and stereotypes by definition are heuristics, right? They're shortcuts, they're assumptions about a particular culture or a demographic or a type of person based on perception, which may or may not be true for any particular individual and may or may not be based on evidence. So in order to process the information, we use these mental shortcuts um, and then fill in the blanks with uh, things like those on this list here. So you might fill in the blanks with family history or personal experiences, things like where you grew up or who you grew up around. Um, you might fill in the blanks with your personal values or with educational experiences. So maybe things that you've learned through your schooling. Um, you might use historical influences, like how you perceive certain groups have been treated throughout history. Um, or you might be um, influenced by things in culture, like things that you see in the media. Um, so unconscious thought can be valuable in some ways, right? In that it helps us with uh, categorizing, saving time and energy, helps us to make sense of the world through these shortcuts so we're not processing every single piece of information in its entirety. Um, but the flip side of that is that unconscious thought can come at the price of accuracy because it's based on stereotypes and assumptions. Um, and something to keep in mind is that, and I think that this can be difficult for some people who think that um, consciously they don't have certain biases or they think that they're aware of what their biases are, and aren't necessarily aware that they might have implicit unconscious biases as well. But those two things can be true at the same time. So consciously, you can have this belief that you don't treat people differently based on their identities, that you treat everyone equally, and that those things don't come into play. But it might also be true that unconsciously, you have an implicit bias that's influenced by stereotypes, and that influences your behavior without you necessarily knowing it. And so to that end, we're going to describe some of the different kinds of cognitive biases and how they uh, may come up in the workplace. So cognitive bias is a systematic error, really, in thinking that affects the decisions and the judgments people make. And then these are a list of examples, and we're going to go through them one by one on the following slides. So the first is an availability bias. And the idea with an availability bias is that you're making estimations of what's more likely to happen based on the information that's available to you. So for example, you might overestimate the frequency of plane crashes or the frequency of shark attacks and therefore be afraid of flying in a plane or getting in the ocean. Um, but that estimation is overblown because when those events occur, the information that's available to you is so oversaturated. Um, and it's then at the top of your mind. But in the workplace, this might come up in terms of thinking about who are you going to give an assignment to, right? It might be someone that you've worked with many times. They're the person who you have the most available information. Um, and they're the person that's at the top of your mind, so they're the person you're going to give the assignment to. Um, so that's one shortcut uh, cognitive bias that might apply in the workplace. Um, another bias is an attribution bias, and the idea is that um, we may have a bias for folks who are in our in-group as opposed to folks who are in an out-group. So uh, folks that are in our in-group, we're familiar with, we attribute certain characteristics to them, um, which can often help us excuse their behaviors. Whereas for folks in an out-group where we might not be familiar with them personally or familiar with their kind of way of thinking, uh, we apply stereotypes to them and therefore there are no excuses for their bad behavior. Another bias that comes up in the workplace is an anchoring bias. And the idea is that 
um, your initial valuation of something might influence your final valuation of something without you realizing it. So for example, if you're interviewing a new candidate and you ask them about their rates of pay with former employers, and if they say, you know, historically I've made $20 an hour, when you're thinking about making them an offer for their new position, that final valuation is going to be anchored by the information you already have, um, as opposed to thinking about that final valuation independently. We use that anchoring as a shortcut. Um, and another example of a cognitive bias is a confirmation bias, which is something we see a lot in social media. A lot of people that are on social media surround themselves with people who think from similarly to them, new sources that report things in a way that confirms what they already believe to be true. Um, this picture is an example of an ad, a Buick ad, um, and Buick is trying to associate its cars with millennials. Um, there tends to be a stereotype of Buick drivers as Buick is an older model, tends to be driven by older folks, and Buick is trying to use this ad um, to kind of break the confirmation bias to associate Buicks with younger folks as opposed to Buicks with older folks. Um, and then there's an affinity bias, which is uh, the idea is that you might favor people who have, who are like you or have similar backgrounds to you. And this comes up in terms of interviewing or again, in terms of thinking about who to give assignments to. And sometimes uh, that kind of association can be um, maybe innocuous or even helpful. And then sometimes it can be harmful. So for example, I'm from Buffalo, New York originally. And if I were interviewing a candidate in San Diego who happened to be from Buffalo, that would person would probably stick out in my mind when I was thinking about who to give a job offer to, because there's a similarity there. I have an affinity with this person and they're more memorable to me. Um, the unconscious bias part of it can be that people may tend to favor people who have, you know, or of their same racial group or their same gender or their same sexual orientation, something that they feel a connection with as uh, in terms of a protected characteristic, and they might not necessarily do it consciously, um, but this unconscious affinity bias may come into play there. Um, and then we see kind of three different categories of unlawful discrimination and how it comes up um, in the workplace and then often uh, in legal suits when they, when they uh, come up. So the first is disparate treatment. Um, that's a category of, of unlawful discrimination where the person who's claiming that they've been discriminated against is pointing to a protected characteristic and saying, I was treated differently because of this protected characteristic. Um, so they would have to demonstrate that an adverse action was taken against them, such as a demotion or a termination um, or an unfavorable change in their, uh, in their work. Um, that that adverse action was taken because of this protected characteristic. Um, and then it shifts to the employer to be able to demonstrate that the adverse action was not taken because of this protected characteristic, but was based on a legitimate business reason. And then the burden shifts again to the employee to demonstrate that that legitimate business reason is not actually legitimate, that it was taken just as a pretext in order to permit uh, this action based on this protected characteristic. The second category is disparate impact. Um, and how disparate impact claims come up is usually it's a, what would appear to be a facially neutral policy, but then has a disparate impact on a particular group of people. So you may have a facially neutral policy um, in terms of there was a study that was done, there was an auditioning for orchestras. And the vast majority of folks who were offered um, a position were male. When they did blind auditions, the offers were 50-50 male and female. So even though it was based on an objective criteria, the impact was disparate. And then the third category is really just kind of straight up othering people, right? Behaviors and actions that exclude 
single out or separate a person, um, which may or may not actually amount to unlawful discrimination depending on the facts. Uh, with race discrimination in particular, there are several different kind of subcategories of how that manifests itself. One is ancestry, so a bias against, for example, a Chinese American uh, related to their Asian ancestry, not necessarily related to their country of origin. Another example would be physical characteristics, so discriminating against someone based on their skin color or even based on a feature like their hair texture. There are also discrimination based on race-linked characteristics, such as um, genetic predisposition, like uh, disposition for sickle cell anemia. Um, race discrimination exists as far as perception, right? assuming that a person is a member of a particular racial group. Race discrimination based on cultural norms, so based on if someone speaks with an accent or if they dress in a particular way. A discrimination based on association. So someone who might not necessarily be part of a protected race, but is associates with a protected race. Um, and then uh, something they refer to as race plus, which is intersectionality. So not just bias against someone based on their race, but maybe bias based on um, a combination of things. So discriminating against someone who's black and gay or discriminating against Asian women, for example. Um, and then the next part is how this unconscious bias manifests itself in the workplace. Um, and I mean, as you can see here, the list is numerous of how unconscious bias can create hidden barriers in different kind of aspects of the workplace. And that would include uh, networking opportunities, access to information and internal networks, um, get uh, job assignments or being assigned certain projects, being assigned mentors or being able to get sponsors for certain events, um, access to training and development opportunities, being able to have uh, interactions with clients or customers, um, access to information or access to folks who are the decision makers or the stakeholders of the company, um, certain groups of people maybe not receiving adequate feedback or getting really bare bones evaluation so that they don't have an opportunity to improve or straight up advancement opportunities, not being given a raise or a promotion or an opportunity to um, advance your skills. And so a lot of times um, discrimination comes up in kind of what what we call here small acts of disrespect. So again, through an unconscious bias lens of a name of someone maybe mistakenly being left off a list or a supervisor failing to introduce someone during a meeting, failing to include certain folks in work-related social engagements based on unconscious bias, um, or invitations that might implicitly exclude some folks. The example here, um, if a company holiday party is not wheelchair accessible, you're uh, implicitly excluding your disabled employees from attending that event. Um, this could also come up if you take calls or if you text while you're speaking to certain groups of people, but not with others. Um, if you greet certain folks, but then not others when they walk into the room, or if you make certain interruptions or inside jokes or roll your eyes with some folks, um, but not with others. And those kinds of small acts of disrespect um, can be categorized in, in kind of these terms. We talk about micro inequities and micro regressions. And these are terms that you might have heard um, in certain you know, bystander trainings or unconscious bias trainings, um, but it's worth reiterating. So a micro inequity is, is a short, small event, oftentimes covert, it can be hard to prove because a lot of times it might be unintentional. But again, the idea is that the, the impact is, um, is inequitable, as opposed to a microaggression, which is the act itself that often stereotypes or denigrates a person um, based on some characteristic through this unconscious bias. Um, and this picture here gives some examples of how microaggressions might come up in the workplace 
And so, for example, this uh, someone asking a black woman, why do you sound white? Right. Making uh, that's an act that that stereotypes that person um, that they should sound black as opposed to uh, white. So then the next portion of this is talking about social movements um, and certain social movements have permeated the workplace and have brought to light a lot of these issues, these issues of unconscious bias um, that employers should be aware of. So one of the social movements that's come about in the past several years is the Me Too movement, um, which of course has been a movement bringing to light sexual harassment and sexual assault in the workplace. Um, and you know, sexual assault and sexual harassment can happen to any gender, by any gender. Um, but that's something that, um, again, kind of sometimes these microaggressions come into play. Sometimes it's overt, sometimes it's conscious, sometimes it's unconscious bias um, that feeds into that. Um, and then another social movement that we wanted to highlight is the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, this, this picture actually sums it up quite nicely, the distinction between uh, saying Black Lives Matter versus saying All Lives Matter. Um, and the idea is that saying Black Lives Matter is not to the exclusion of other racial groups, but is to, um, to highlight the fact that Black lives are in danger um, and that Black lives need protection um, and to be able to say that Black lives matter um, independently. And so this is a slide that we wanted to include um, because it, it, it pulls some quotes from an experience of, of a Black person who um, then it incorporates a lot of kind of this unconscious bias that this person has experienced. Um, and whether that unconscious that bias might at sometimes be conscious um, or sometimes might be unconscious. But this person writes, I grieve because when I am out in the community, some white people and other non-black communities of color seem surprised that I actually have command of the English language. They also write, I grieve because I can't take my parents to an upscale restaurant without being asked if I can afford it by the greeter. I grieve because black lives are only valued in this country if the life is used to entertain and to make money. I grieve because it took the world to watch a death conducted in such an extreme, heinous and egregious way for people to finally be utterly outraged. And so again, kind of thinking in terms of, of social movements, um, Me Too is an example, Black Lives Matter is an example, and kind of the manifestation of some of these social movements has led to what we call cancel culture. And this slide gives some examples of what uh, ca cancel culture is and how folks define it. So kind of a simple definition is that there are people in the digital space that are using their platforms to express dissent for people or ideas or companies or products. And then a more elaborate definition is that cancel culture refers to a public mass withdrawal of support, um, the support for a company or for a particular person or for a product. Um, and that withdrawal of support is typically in response to this perceived poor behavior or wrongdoings of a person or a brand or a company. Um, and individuals who might take part in a cancel culture demonstration typically will then broadcast their views and their reason for canceling someone or something online. And there are some competing points of view about uh, kind of what cancel culture is and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing or somewhere in between. Um, some folks contend that cancel culture is really the oldest form of consumer advocacy. It is a case where consumers let their feet or more precisely their wallets do the talking. Um, and then on the flip side, there are some folks that see cancel culture as a virus in our society, that it's mob mentality by people who are behind their keyboards trying to ruin the lives of people who don't fit their narrative. 
Um, and then kind of some folks are more in between that cancel culture is really just a reflexive knee jerk reaction um, by the powerful. It's a demonstration of institutions unwillingness to tolerate any controversy um, and that it's not driven necessarily by politics one way or another that those are complaining could be liberal or conservative. Um, and then to kind of tie it all back into how uh, cancel culture, social media relate to the workplace. Uh, cancel culture typically permeates the workplace because of social media. There are calls from the public to cancel an employee because of her past statements on social media. And these statements might be wholly unrelated to the work that that employee performs for her employer. Um, and then there also might be calls to cancel a company because of its decision maybe not to terminate an employee based on the past statements that she made on social media. Um, and it's important to remember that social media is designed for engagement and conflict creates engagement. So conflict over these, uh, these statements that might, um, might no longer be appropriate, um, that in itself creates engagement. And even if people don't necessarily get mad about what a company is doing, um, they might get mad about what the company is not doing. And the last thing we just wanted to highlight for you all is this recent executive order on combating race and sex stereotyping. And this is just an excerpt from the order. And it says that many people are pushing a vision for America that is grounded in hierarchies based on collective political or social identities rather than in the inherent and equal dignity of every person as an individual. This ideology is rooted in the pernicious and false belief that America is an irredeemably racist and sexist country and that some people simply on account of their race or sex are oppressors and that racial and sexual identities are more important than our common status as human beings and Americans. So all of that said, there was a lot of information that we just threw at you, um, but RC is now going to distill that information into discussing corporate responses um, to unconscious bias and uh, social movements. Thank you, Jacqueline. So this section, part three, corporate responses, will cover a lot of material from corporate statements to speech about the company, to speech in and out of the workplace and public cries for a response. This section lends itself to collaboration and I would invite people to share their experiences or their company's responses with respect to some of these topics in the chat as we go along. Blending, oh, one, one slide back. <laughs> so blending of social activism and the workplace is not entirely new, but it is increasingly a part of the modern workplace. Employees no longer look to employers to provide jobs and just jobs, and consumers are no longer looking to businesses just for the goods and services they provide, but also to bring about societal change. And although some businesses have taken it upon themselves to incorporate humanitarian efforts into their business model, it is by no means a requirement for a business to do so. But consumers are actively looking at which of their favorite businesses is putting out a statement in support or a statement against a particular event or cause, which will help them determine whether they wanna continue patronizing that business. And for employees, it's also factoring into whether they wanna continue working for that business. So businesses are now in the spotlight, not only for the goods and services or jobs they provide, but also for the message they put out and for their role in framing the narrative around an issue. So the spotlight is on, it's blinding, and you feel the heat. What do you do? If you decide to issue a statement, what do you say? Next slide. Now I can't tell you exactly what to say, but I can tell you what we found to be successful. Corporate statements should come from the top the CEO rather than the DE&I officer, the diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. If from a DE&I officer, it might be ignored by employees or customers who disagree with the DE&I concepts. Maybe some people don't even believe DE&I is a thing. Maybe they like it, maybe they don't. But everyone listens to the CEO. Identify your audience. Who is the audience? 
employees, customers, shareholders, potential jurors in a particular jurisdiction, the general public. Depending on the audience, consider asking for, for employee input if the audience is the employee, right? So for example, Jackson Lewis, our firm, recently circulated a survey monkey to all of its employees on whether it should institute a vaccine mandate. I don't know what the result was, I'm not gonna tell you what I said, but it was a simple two question with an input for providing additional feedback and an anonymous submission. And it garnered the ability to have employees provide their input on a hot button issue. Be precise about what the company condemns and what it supports. It's important to be precise because employees and consumers compare your statements to your behavior. It is this, what do I say? It's at this, what do I st say stage that provides a business with the opportunity to take stock in itself. What kind of business is this? Who is our base? What are our values? In what direction do we want to grow? These statements are the company's opportunity to demonstrate company morals. And people watch corporate behavior, as I mentioned. If you commit to do something, then do it. You don't want to lose credibility with your audience by not taking action. Recognize the potential adverse impact on the group at issue while acknowledging the impact on other minority groups and keep all employees in mind, which can be a very difficult thing to do, but it can be done with a well-crafted statement. State the resources available for your employees, such as leave, affinity groups, counseling, certain policies you may have instituted, certain positions like a DE&I coordinator that you may have uh, instituted, um, but promise some action. The least a company can do is form an ad hoc committee to study the issue and make a recommendation. So an example of what this looks like. In early, in early April, for all of you baseball fans, Major League Baseball announced that it was moving the 2021 All-Star Game out of Atlanta in response to the new Georgia law that has civil rights groups concerned about the potential to restrict voting access to people of color. MLB's statement provided in part, MLB fundamentally supports voting rights for all Americans and opposes restrictions to the ballot box. We, pr we proudly use our platform to encourage baseball fans and communities throughout the country to perform their civic duty and actively participate in the voting process. Fair access to voting continues to have our game's unwavering support. The MLB statement was clear and precise on what MLB supports while keeping all baseball fans and all potential fans and consumers in mind. MLB moved the 2021 All-Star Game to Denver, Colorado, a state where it is arguably easier to access uh, voting for all state citizens. This move still came with its own criticisms from all angles, emblematic of the fact that you can't please everyone, but it was a bold move and a clear stance, and it generated a lot of buzz around MLB at that time. So your company's actions should be aligned with the corporate statement. For example, if you publish a statement condemning racism and you do something that perpetuates racial stereotypes, then you are sending conflicting messages and you will instantly lose credibility with your audience. Think about how your company can respond to social justice issues within the communities that it affects. Invest money and resources. For example, to address the health disparities amplified by COVID-19 in underserved urban and rural communities. Today, corporate statements without action are generating criticism and, in, and can impact the bottom line. So crafting a good corporate statement, if indeed you do decide to issue one, is crucial. And also remember that if you don't decide to issue one, that's also something that consumers look at, right? Next slide, please. Now say the issue is no longer how we respond to this social movement or cause generally, but is instead, how do I respond when a former employee, perhaps emboldened by these social movements, sends emails or makes a Facebook posting criticizing the company, company for a lack of diversity or for alleged racist comments or sexual harassment? We just saw a very clear example of this on an industry-wide basis about three or so months ago with the craft brewery kind of industry. And this reckoning brought about by social media from you know, 
posts by current and former employees alleging a culture of sexual harassment and sexism within the industry. Next slide. So how do you respond if these allegations are coming from a former employee? Let's review some options. Similar to issuing a corporate statement, be aware of your audience. The audience is never just a single former employee. Your audience may consist of current or potential employees, consumers or customers, or potential jurors, possibly even stakeholders. Draft a response that takes the high road and demonstrates respect for the critic and your audience. But how do you do that? Thank the former employee for speaking up and state that the company is listening. You cannot afford to be tone deaf when your customers, consumers, suppliers, stakeholders, current and former employees are watching and listening. State your DEI, anti-discrimination, anti-harassment policies, plans and actions. Sketch out additional actions to improve on those attempts in the past, what additional actions the company is willing to take. Remember that the least you can do is create an ad hoc committee to study the issue and make a recommendation. And again, invite input from your employees. And this can be from former or current employees. Set up a 1-800 numbers to screen idea, screen ideas, complaints, plans, suggestions. Consider your consumer base. You may also want to consider doing an audit, an internal survey, perhaps an investigation on the claim, depending on the statute of limitations. You may want to consult counsel in this regard, and if you do, we are here for you. Uh, depending on the allegation, like I said, you may want to do an investigation. For, an ex for example, if this allegation is one of sexual harassment by an employee that is still employed, even though the allegation is coming from a former employee, you may want to conduct an investigation and potentially take remedial measures, particularly because the alleged harasser is a current employee. This, you know, this behavior, if you fail to take certain steps, it could end up resulting in a failure to prevent harassment cause of action because you had already been put on notice of this behavior and that could wind your company up in a whole world of trouble. Next slide. Now, what if the allegation is from a current employee? This requires some additional considerations. This could be an old complaint or a complaint that is outside of the statute of limitations. A similar analysis would be done for this as would be done for the former employee, except there are some additional things to think about and whether you should investigate the complaint. First, you have to be mindful of the potential for retaliation because this is a current employee. But also remember to take the high road because the response could end up posted somewhere, social media, maybe the news. And again, thank the employee for speaking up. Remind the employee of the company policies. Hopefully you have some, another shameless plug. If you don't, we can help you draft them. Um, regarding diversity and inclusion and anti-discrimination policies. Again, you are educating a potential jury if this letter or response become public or if it becomes evidence. If the complaint is within the applicable statute of limitations, you will want to investigate it. But keep in mind if it touches upon an issue that involves the company's values or social activism, you have to be aware of multiple audiences and representations made. Like if you instituted a zero tolerance policy, but this person has been able to slide, a company's behavior needs to be in line with what that company has stated its values are. If the, com if the complaint is outside the statute of limitations, there are three things to think about. First, this is a current employee. So again, you have to be mindful of potential retaliation. Second, we would strongly consider or strongly encourage you to consider investigating these claims, again, especially if they involve a current manager or supervisor, or if they involve a current employment practice. And third, internal stakeholders and external stakeholders are potentially watching how you respond. 
If an investigation is needed for allegations made by either former or current employees, there are ways to be able to do an investigation in-house, but re we recommend considering the use of a third-party investigator, particularly if the accused is a high-profile member of the company or if there is a strong likelihood that the employee will sue. It's always a better argument that the investigation was neutral and unbiased if it comes from a third-party investigator. Next slide. Okay, so maybe these social justice, justice movements haven't inspired your employees to make complaint and everything is fine on that front, but they have inspired some lively, potentially heated conversations in the workplace. Are you required to allow your employees to express their political or social justice beliefs, or can you res restrict such speech? The short answer is yes. You can restrict such speech in the workplace, but of course, there are always some caveats. In other words, it depends. Next slide. Something that we often see is an argument revolving freedom of speech, um, is the argument revolving freedom of speech. But do private sector employees have freedom of speech rights to make sexist, racist, anti-Semitic, anti-LGBTQ+, or other inflammatory statements? No, not under federal law. Employees have often mistaken the belief, or often have the mistaken belief, that their statements enjoy blanket protections under the First Amendment. The First Amendment specifically prevents the federal government from interfering with freedom of speech, but it does not guarantee the right in private settings, including in private workspaces and in social media platforms, as we've recently seen. Therefore, a private sector employee's speech, whether made in person or in writing on social media, are not shielded from employment consequences under the mantle of freedom of speech. And we will get into this in a later slide, but such employee expressions would also include the wearing of t-shirts, sweatshirts, or masks with offensive or harassing or maybe politically charged messaging, as we're seen in the images from the Capitol riot. Private employers have the right to say what speech is and is not acceptable in the workplace. Speech cannot be harassing, discriminatory, threatening, or incite violence, and most employees get that. But where limits of speech get tricky under federal law and some state law occurs if the speech concerns work conditions like pay, benefits, harassment or discrimination, supervi or supervisor conduct. The NLRA, the National Labor, Labor Relations Act, says even if your employees are not unionized, the employer cannot stop them from speaking out about issues that affects groups of employees. So actions employers can take depend on whether they are a private or a public employer, you know, government contractors, other, other public employers. What is said or posted, um, you know, is it, regarding wages, hours or conditions of employment? Is it a complaint of harassment? Is it protected by whistleblower protections? Is it a complaint about unlawful activity? Is there an applicable company policy and whether the workplace is union or non-union? Next slide. Protected concerted activity, even for at-will employees who are not part of a union, employees also find protections under the NLRA for conduct that occurs outside of the workplace, even if we don't like it. If the statements concerning working conditions, how they are being treated by managers or supervisors, again, pay, harassment, discrimination, they may be protected even if we don't like what they're saying. As, and as employees, and as employers, we need to be particularly cautious about steps that we take to address that conduct. My point with all of this is don't fall into the fantasy that is at-will employment. Uh, and by that, I mean, don't fall into the, I can't get rid of any, or I can get rid of anyone at any time for any reason I choose. You should talk to your HR or other members of your legal team or outside counsel before taking any sort of terminating decisions, um, you know, changing schedules, suspensions, et cetera. 
Next slide. As we mentioned earlier, employees' expression would also include the wearing of t-shirts, sweatshirts, or masks with offensive or harassing messages uh, and other types of political statements. So the question arises, do I have to allow my employees to wear social justice related gear, t-shirts, masks, or buttons? The answer is no, you do not, but consistency is key. And to avoid claims of discrimination or racial insensitivity, your decision has to be based on a reason that applies across the board. Meaning best practice is to say employees cannot wear anything that contains branding outside of your company brand. That means no political, no sports gear, no college gear, nothing. Otherwise you open yourself up to a world of issues like if they can wear X social justice related gear, why can't I wear this social justice related gear or other type of cause or belief related gear? An alternative that some of our clients have chosen is that, and, and that I think you know, strikes a nice compromise, particularly if the company is trying to be more socially conscious, is to provide company branded products like masks or buttons that express the company's values like equity, justice, peace, fairness, messages that theoretically no one should have a problem with um, because it's broad enough to encompass a variety of views. Next slide. Another topic that comes up is managing off-duty conduct. And you know, how do you handle off-duty conduct? Employers often say, again, my employees are at will, so I can terminate them at any time for any reason. Again, do not fall into that trap. Do not fall into that fantasy. At some point, you are going to have to provide a reason for the person's employment or for the you know, a reason why that person's employment was terminated. Your employee is going to ask, and if the employee is seeking unemployment benefits, you're going to have to tell the California Department of Labor or other agency as to the reason for their termination. When you don't provide a reason for their termination, it only invites the employee to fill in the blank. And, you know, you don't want someone filling in the blank and setting the narrative with a protected or unlawful reason. And also remember that while an employee can be terminated at any time for most any reason, the, the reason cannot be retaliatory or discriminatory, and even some political activity is protected, which brings us to the next slide. Can employers discharge employees who participate in protests? Again, it depends. There are a few labor code uh, sections that speak to this particular question. Labor Code Section 1101 provides that no empl employer shall make, adopt, or enforce any rule, regulation, or policy forbidding or preventing employees from engaging or participating in politics or from becoming candidates for public office, controlling or directing or tending to control or direct the political activities or affiliations of the employees. There's a similar code section, 1102, um, which I will not read. You can look it up. Um, just as these sections provide uh, protections for employees' political speech in the workplace, they also provide some protections for political speech outside of the workplace. Labor Code Section 1101, again, prohibits employers from attempting to control the political activities of its employees. And Labor Code Section 1102, uh, allows employees to freely engage in political activity like protests and prohibits employers from forcing employees to follow the political leanings of the employer. And Labor Code Section 98.6 forbids employers from discharging, discriminating, or retaliating against or taking any adverse action against an employee or applicant because of the employer or applicant's engagement in, uh, in lawful behavior committed during non-work hours away from the employee's workplace, employer's workplace. Employees who participate in legitimate, peaceful political protests are protected by law in California. But the question then becomes, well, at what point is it considered unlawful? Is it based on the employer belief that the activity is unlawful? And, you know, these questions are ones that are, we don't have answers to quite yet, right? These are ever-changing areas of the law 
Um, they're relatively new questions, and, and we're really only now starting to see courts really dive into these issues. Um, one such example is with Leah Snyder versus Alight Solutions, which is currently pending in um, the Central District of California. And this involves a California woman who posted photos of herself um, in the Capitol partaking in those events, you know, in January. And her employer fired her based on its belief that what she did was illegal. Now, um, I believe there was a motion for uh, a motion to dismiss filed by the employer. The last I saw on the docket, the, still, the case was still going forward. So that motion can be considered having failed. Um, but we're starting to see a lot more of these cases throughout the country. And we're watching di diligently on how this area of law expands. Uh, next slide, please. So disciplinary action and social media, um, kind of going on what we just talked about, um, what, can an, what can a company do when the public calls for a company to take action against the employee for their social media postings? Can employers base disciplinary action or termination decisions on a social media posting? So this is another one of those typical lawyer answers. Yes, but it depends. Um, according to the California Constitution, each citizen has an inalienable right to obtain and pursue privacy when combined with section with Labor Code Section 980, which provides additional protections related to, related to social media. These laws are meant to protect employees' privacy on their personal social media platforms, while also pro prohibiting employers from asking employees for their login information and passwords. Yet, even though these laws provide some sort of privacy protection for employees and the use of their social media, it does not mean that an employee's public social media posts are protected. If an employee begins posting content beyond their private followers, they waive their right to privacy, as my colleague mentioned. As a result, they can be disciplined for their posts, especially when these posts are not deemed to be related to their workplace. Um, and there are a few kind of considerations and questions to ask yourself when you're contemplating terminating somebody or taking some sort of disciplinary action against an employee. Number one, we have to make sure that the information you learned does not fall into one of those protected classifications. Ask. How did, this, how did this come to the company's attention? Did we find it ourselves? If so, managers and supervisors should stay away from the employee's social media sites. Two, we really need to consider how we learned the information. Did someone else send it to us? You know, similar to number one. Um, was it from a public or private post? That is the key. Was it anonymous? Does the information touch on the workplace and how? Um, and also consider whether your company where your company stands with certain issues. Did the company take a stance? Does this decision to terminate or to not terminate fall in line with that stance? Uh, next slide, which in the interest of time we can skip. Um, and so to reiterate some of the points from the earlier slides, if an employer has an issue with their employee's off-duty conduct, they need to consider California's applicable laws, right? Labor Code Section 1101, 1102.98.6, the effects on the business and the litigation exposure they may have to face. Looking into their past conduct and reviewing whether they may have consistently applied these company protocols can also help in determining the likelihood of an employee succeeding in their legal actions. So this kind of requires you to be very introspective about the kinds of um, behaviors and policies that have been implemented in the past. Um, not only does the business have a heavy, uh, you know, have to weigh heavily the legal problems that can result in pursuing these actions against their employees, but they also have to take into account the potential loss of sales and customers if the issue becomes common knowledge. Consider your business goodwill and business reputation. In some cases, companies can even suffer when they decide not to take any action as we discussed with 
deciding not to take, uh, not to issue a, a public statement. Next slide. But all of this depends on your risk profile, right? How risk averse are you? Where do you fall within the risk continuum? This decision will color any response uh, that you'll craft, both internally and externally. But something to always remember is to avoid knee-jerk reactions. Very often, some companies respond to the wrong things in a crisis or in the wrong way. They circumvent the hard stuff because it means having to take a position. Companies do not necessarily have to cave in and take the side of the public. Um, but if it's a brand you feel strongly and justified on, in your stance, then stay the course. You know, issue that statement um, and whatnot. Corporate, uh, corporations need to take into consideration what they want to say now, that what they say now will influence uh, how they're perceived and possibly additional action later down the road. Next slide. Um, another thing to consider is just general structural changes, right? Like hiring processes, the policies, who makes up the hiring team, work assignment processes, who delegates the work, who's getting it, mentorship programs. Um, hopefully your company has one. If not, that's always something to consider. Um, promotion criteria and importantly, training. Um, next slide, please. Um, never forget the power of workplace training, hosting trainings for management level employees on how to recognize their unconscious biases might lead them to make certain insensitive statements that we previously talked about. Consider implementing bystander training, train employees on their rights, hopefully in such a way that reaffirms the culture of anti-harassment, anti-discrimination, and doesn't spark a whole bunch of complaints. But even if it does, you know, this is an opportunity for the company to tackle these issues and take stock in where it is um, and what policies it has in place. It provides an opportunity for the company to act in line with the company morals. Um, and trainings can also be a powerful tool within progressive discipline for employees and when fulfilling obligations to prevent harassment. And so last slide, the key takeaways don't be deterred, but don't do nothing. Understand your risk profile and understand where you fall within that risk profile. Review corporate policies to ensure they align with the position the company chooses to take. Review training manuals. And remember that you have the ability to limit some, but not all speech and regulate some, but not all off-duty conduct. And when in doubt, uh, reach out to your favorite outside counsel. That's the end. Thank you everyone for joining us. I know we went a little over, so thank you for staying for those of you that stayed. And we hope you enjoyed this presentation. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. But otherwise, we're good.